Hello. Welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe with our whole entire investment committee back together here in our Newport Beach headquarters. This is David Bonson. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group. And around this circle, I have Dea Pranas, Brian Saitel, Julian Frazzo, and Robert Graham all together on our investment committee. Fresh off of a big week, uh, as Dea, we traded over $300 million of client capital on Friday alone. Uh, Bonson Group record for single day. Uh, the previous record was $300,000, yeah. so we had a huge uh, huge bump up. I don't know. I, I would guess our rebalance a year ago was probably the second biggest day ever. I can't imagine why it wouldn't have been that way. And that I, I, we'd have to check. I mean, I bet 100. it was 100 to 200 million. So, yeah, yeah we probably doubled That's yeah, that record. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so not, not too Good many work. screw-ups, right? We yeah, have nice a, work. We yeah, didn't. yeah. Things went things went smooth. Uh, we're there's still some you know without revealing too much. There's still some orders that we're working right now because of the size. But uh, but yeah, everything went went great given the the amount of accounts and the amount of assets. And so very very happy. Yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. And you guys, of course, did uh, you and Julian did the podcast last week, talking about uh, a lot of our kind of infrastructure mm. and the way in which we go about doing things. These rebalances, you know, I think are a big deal, but particularly interesting in the ramifications we technically were slight modest net sellers of equities last week um but then w- the rebalance was a lot different coming off of a 25 percent plus year in equities than it would have been had equities done what they did but bonds not done what they did mm-hmm. the, remember it isn't about an asset class going up a lot it's about an asset class going up in proportion to another asset class's mm-hmm. original weightings and, and that's the thing that really could have been much more dramatic is the bulk of trading activity was inside the equity sleeve, the composition of, of trimming down some stocks that just had monumental gains and adding to some that either didn't have monumental gains or in a couple of cases might have even had slight downticks as, as of late. But the stock to bond weightings, it, it was because of the bond rally of 2019 that this rebalance was so much less dramatic than it otherwise would have been you know probably, probably the sell-off in in beginning or, or the end of 18 too probably you know you know helped a lot too as far as the rate weightings not be too far off you know equities, yeah equities no, that's right formed by five percent over bonds that's right over that period of time yeah so like in 20 uh 19 early 19 coming off of 18 there was a lot of uh additional buying to equity because bonds had rallied in december and stocks had sold off so much and the the way those weightings stood but the proportional rally of stocks, bonds in 19 made things a bit different. But you look at our emerging markets thesis. I think we had we you know uh, we have that position sized the way we want it. Small cap uh, for those clients that are not fully income intensive. Um, you know we had we had a really strong year with the strategy that we use in the small and mid cap area. So there was some trimming going on there. But the, I mean that was just monumental gains in 2019. So. You know, we've talked about a lot. I just think we did a lot to reduce risk and, and position people well. And then now, you know, a lot of focus on those themes from that we talked about a couple weeks ago that continue to be our, our big 2020 sort of perspectives. Midstream energy, emerging markets, uh, um, not, you know, more neutered expectations in equity markets. And then, of course, preparing for where we want to go with alternatives. All right, so we're not going to talk about impeachment, are we? I mean, do we need to? Trials going to start that, later? That's, yeah, I haven't heard anything yeah. Yeah, about that. You know, I actually barely have heard much because I can't even watch the cover. It's so redundant. You know, the same exact thing said on one network and then the same thing. It might be a different message, but the same thing said over and over on a different network. In my apartment in New York City, they have CNN on in the elevator, and it's on the 34th floor, so that's a pretty good ways up and ways down. And those, that's exactly the total amount of time I spend listening to CNN is in, <laughs> in that elevator. And is, and that, is that a story that anybody really cares about, you think? Do you... I don't. Well, market-wise, definitely not. Even nationally, yeah. I think there's some people, like NPR listeners, okay. you know. <laughs> In New York, oh, and, and, and then and then on the other side of it, there's some like uh-huh. Fox News uh-huh. diehard, you know. But as across the country, like sitting around having family dinner, like, hey, Johnny, how was your homework, and what do you yeah. think of this yeah. impeachment thing? I don't, I don't see it. Have yeah, you put in a, a request already to the building to get uh, another channel in the lift? <laughs> well, I, I I didn't ask for a different channel. I suggested that it might be more relaxing for people 
who work all day long in high stress work, like we're sitting here managing money, and there's a lot of other people in money management mm. in New York, so I can't be the only one. And some of the New York Knicks live in my building, so I don't think they're coming home feeling all happy and relaxed every day either. <laughs> and I just thought maybe they might want to put on, like, I don't know, the Weather Channel or even ESPN, but maybe the Knicks don't want ESPN yeah, on, yeah. and I don't want CNN on, because ESPN it's might stress me. them out. <clears throat> but they're the, they have the worst record, I think, in basketball, don't they? Oh, no. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I would imagine. N- none of us watch them, so I guess yeah. that's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, no, I think... Um, but the reason I brought up CNN in the elevator is I'm not joking. I've never once been looked up and seen it in the elevator when they weren't talking about the impeachment over the, since mm. these last few mm. months. Not one time. It wasn't like usually it's on that and then every now and then they're doing some other story, you know. It's a hundred percent. And and so anyways, from a market standpoint, it, it, you know, markets are up uh, a couple percent in January already. What are S and P's on the year? I mean, I mean as of Friday that was three and a and a half. So it's, more like yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I, mean, I think the Dow is last the Dow's last, but S and P is that yeah, three yeah. Mar- three handle. So and that's all since the House already voted and we know it's going to the Senate. So, so uh, again, that's not new news. I mean, the market has not has shrugged this thing off since the whistleblower, since the transcript, and then you go all the way back to Mueller and whatnot. But, but I think that the reason why we're going to talk today about global uh, economics and a kind of macro thing, a perspective, is because we're too early in earnings season to have a robust conversation on where earnings are going, where they've gone, what we think they indicate. I have a few thoughts already, but I think we got to hold back just to let. We've only had mostly financial companies report. It, you just don't have enough information yet to really get much of an indicator. So earnings is the is the most important market sensitive conversation out there. But we're we're waiting. You know, it's early innings. Um, I think global macro though might be something that we need to kind of dive into a little. We've all read a research report that came out over the weekend from one of our significant research partners goes into a number of pretty significant research trends. But I guess I'll kick it off to you guys and we'll just kind of go back and forth. We don't have to take turns. We can fight, argue, interrupt, do what we want to do to make this interesting for our listeners. Robert, what is your assessment right now of the global macro picture? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? Or is it uh, mixed? I think largely what's happening now is people are looking at a, a partial resolution of the trade deal as, as kind of a, you know, taking off some of the makeup and they're they're addressing maybe the 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 finer issues across the macro landscape. So they're saying, okay, now that you know the, the China situation with regards to US trade is is solved for a little while, what does it really mean regionally? What's actually happening in all these different countries now that the trade picture is a little bit cleaner? Similar uh, in Europe, you know, there were fears about a, a trade spat going on with the Europeans. You know, Macron and Trump kind of uh, resolved that a little bit with regards to the, um, the the tech company tax. So now people are digging in, looking at the specific situations. I think, uh, you know, largely there's there's signs of you know a little bit of a bottoming having happened across across the world. Large. I don't, I don't mean to group everything together, but I think the picture largely is 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 a good one. I wouldn't say rosy, but there's there's signs of increased growth in places that have you know been stagnant, quite frankly, in the last uh, couple of months. Mm-hmm. Julian, do you um, do you see anything that might be pertinent to the picture right now? One that a lot of people are talking about, and maybe two something that others aren't talking about. Um, that people are not talking about. It's a good question. But I, maybe I, start with the easier one. What What do you think that a lot of people are talking about that you're that you find to be? And I, I guess that's like you have to look at by regions. But uh, basically, if you look at uh, just to quote the OECD's uh, you know leading economic indicators, what they're saying at the moment is that um, global activity you know, it will bottom and and is expected to rebound in the next six months. And then that's for, by regions, you have like you look at China and. Uh, they have stimulus in place, and now they have the phase one China U.S. China trade deal that you know is hopefully gonna go and help the Chinese economy as well. In Europe, which and Germany in particular in the eurozone, being a big export country, it looks like uh, it's starting to bottom as well, and it's, ge- it's getting better. So you have signs as well of uh, some improvement in Europe, and also with Brexit not not being a big risk anymore, but something that's you know. You can assume there's not going to be a hard Brexit, and you know that there's a past. Brexit is happening. It's not a question mark, and I think you know people are moving on. Um, just what, what looks uh, like what is giving you reason to believe there's some bottoming in Europe? That's definitely a view others have, including our friends at Strategus. But what makes you? What are you seeing that's indicating a bottoming process? Is it the LEIs? Um, I guess it, it's uh, it's looking at. Uh, um, 
export um, economies that are big exporters like Germany, you know, where there's been the threat of uh, U.S. Uh, European tariffs and so far nothing really has happened. And, and the uh, manufacturing uh, PMI indicators in Europe, uh, in Germany, are, are getting better. So I think it's, it's early signs of really um, leading indicators coming out of the, you know, the leading manufacturing countries in Europe, like Germany in particular, that, that are going the right direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we look at the, the chart mm. of PMI in Germany, and we're all, of course, looking at it right now. It's not up <laughs> on our, our, the screen for our, our listeners, but... You, you see the just massive collapse in manufacturing that actually took place in Germany and in the United States uh, in exports, imports, you know, overall trade back in the financial crisis. And since then, you, you really do have a very different looking chart for U.S. versus Germany. The shape isn't altogether different, although Germany had a more significant second bout down in 2011, 2012. But then they got kind of a, a reflation of manufacturing um, in 2016, 17. And I think that's one of the things people will point out, that it wasn't just U.S.'s pickup, but you kind of had a global coordination of monetary policy that also led to improvement in European conditions. And so it, it argues for the fact that the monetary policies have been just as big a driver as some of the U.S. fiscal policies. But, but, then, but then it's utterly collapsed. It started collapsing much earlier than the U.S. trade war, China stuff. You see a tiny bit of pickup as of late. Is that sort of the indicator on page three there, the mm-hmm. bottom? Is that kind of the reason why we might feel Germany is bottoming? Um, it's, a big, it's a big question because I've had a bullish U.S. and neutral global view for some time that was bearish European. I don't know how anyone could forfeit a bullish U.S. and even stay neutral global if Europe goes from the bearish to, to even neutral camp, let alone bullish. So, so Europe's fate, you know, I think it's possible to be bullish globally and bearish Europe. I don't think it's possible to be bullish Europe and bearish globally. It sounds like there's even glimmers of hope that right now Europe is in a better position. Is that kind of what you're getting at? And is well, the PMI, yeah, that, little, that little dip up what you're looking at in manufacturing? Yeah, I would say on the margin, Europe uh, recovering. But I think it, it's always like uh, Europe has a you know, tendency to underperform in terms of you know, growth. So it's going to be sluggish growth. And it's probably going to be still below the U.S. In, you know, that, that's growing 2-3%. Europe, I, I guess it's not. It's, it's getting better, but it's still not going to be great. It's still going to be mm-hmm. uh, sluggish uh, European growth. Muddle, I would, I would muddle expect. through growth, yeah, yeah. but not but not recessionary. What do you exactly. think, Brian? No, I would agree with with all those assessments. I mean, if you look at the chart, I mean, the turn up is really not a whole lot yet. Yeah. So we're kind of looking at leading indicators going forward, and things are getting a little less bad. Things are starting to bottom and turn up. And I mean, in Europe, it's like they were in the middle of this trade issue. You know, there's Brexit that they've got, you know, issue, you know, dealing with. Then there was a China trade deal and they're huge exporters there. And and I think that's why you're seeing Germany. So it's looked at as sort of just the the area itself. The Eurozone is looked at as sort of this this indicator for the world going forward. To your point, I agree. It's hard to be, you know, bullish on Europe and not on the rest of the world. If you were to have that Mm -hmm. thesis, Um, I do think it's important. So yeah, I would agree with those things. It's difficult. I don't know how you guys feel. Um, I think that you have to be able to look at it in two different ways. One is the secular condition, which I think is much more long-term, generational, decade-oriented. And one is cyclically within the period we're in. Could you have a long-term view that Europe is doomed to secular uh, stagnation, um, as you talk about, Julian, just very muted growth prospects. Just demographics. Demographic, well, yeah. Demographics well, and policy mm-hmm. and debt drag mm-hmm. and shared currency. Mm-hmm. Other than that, how was the play, Mrs. <laughs> right. Lincoln? Right. <laughs> but, um, but then within that, being a bit more open to and, – and actually, I'm going to switch gears ask you about something different than I even said I was going to. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to then be open to the, the idea that cyclically Europe could have a little improvement – and yet not feel that it fits into an asset allocation plan. You know, do, do, you, do you need to accommodate overweighting Europe it, just if you start to think maybe the, the, the indicators are looking a little better? Uh, so, so, uh, and I'll speak for us what we've traditionally done. If we don't believe in uh, an area to invest, we don't 
invest in it. We don't we don't invest in something for diversification's sake. So as far as Europe goes, if we feel that uh, that there is those uh, re- re- you referred to, maybe cyclically it's okay, but secularly because of uh, plethora of reasons, you know, you said policy, demographic, shared currency. If those things are going to keep Europe down, then uh, then it'll continue to have a muted weighting in our portfolio. Mm-hmm. It really, it really is. Uh, and I'm going to go back to Brian on this because he and I, you know, we're we're beginning to manage money at a similar period of time a long, long time ago. I think that was the last time that this idea that oh, things could be real bad in the U.S., but you could be making money in Europe, or you could be making money in EM. Or, or, or even vice versa, like things were going real well in U.S., but not so well in Europe post-crisis. It was dot-com. It was the aftermath of dot-com. And you had this period where S&Ps had really muted returns 2000, 2005, and, and the EFI didn't. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, and we know, we've talked before about BRIC and the period uh, that they had in those 2000s. So you could look and just say there is an incredible non-correlation, mm-hmm. a diversification benefit on both sides, risk and reward. I don't know if I believe decoupling at all. No. I, I cannot picture right now an environment where things could be horrible in the U.S. and good elsewhere. Yeah, I really can't. Yeah, it is hard. I mean, I would say back to those 2000s, th- that period of time, it was that was when the euro was new. You know, they they went on this new currency, they kind of united things, and there was sort of an initial shine to that uh, paradigm, I think, in economic growth, and it did decouple. We were dealing with our own dot com kind of blow up at that time. And since then, that sort of shine of that single currency has worn off, and then you kind of peel back the onion and you see the issues with it, which is some countries are weaker and some countries are stronger, and they're all sharing the same currency. It's hard to, you know, devalue or or, or increase its value to, to you know for for growth purposes. But at this point, you're right. It's like the correlation of European stocks and the U.S. stocks is what it is. They're pretty pretty correlated. The equity markets tend to be pretty correlated. Um, so where are the better fundamentals, demographics? you know, diversity of economy, all of that, it's, you know, liquidity, all those things are, are here. And, and and so if you're not getting bang for your buck to kind of step into those issues, why, why take it? Yeah. You know? and, and, well, Go ahead. I'm sorry, just the, de- the decoupling you're talking about, are you talking about economic growth wise or, or market wise? Well, I, I am um, actually talking about uh, economic growth and, okay, and okay. I would accept that there could be a lag with it, with, with markets from that. But, but I think that just painting a picture of, Hey, we're going to, if you envision any 20% drawdown in S&Ps, mm-hmm. so I don't care about 5% drawdowns, nor should anybody listening. They're inevitable and unavoidable and mm-hmm. unpredictable and untimable. Sure. Other than that, you know, they're, uh, let's get in front of it. So you have 20% potential drawdown in U.S. that no one wants to go through. They're painful. So we're going to try to diversify the risk of an S&P bear market with Europe and, and EM and China and Japan. I'm not sold on the idea that you could have a 20% down S&P and a 4% down Europe, let alone a 4% yeah. up Europe. It'd probably be a it's negative 30. Happen. It'd probably be yeah. negative 30. You know, it'd be, it'd be a, a like in this mo- Usually in these uh, corrections, like all betas go to, to one or even more, so I would think you're more likely exactly. you know, to have That's a actual bigger I correction. I think that betas go to one for the assets that are generally sub one betas, and they mm-hmm. go to more than one for ones that are usually higher betas. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So Robert, to Brian's point though, would we would you say EM could be different in the sense that the demographics, the fundamentals, all the things that make you want to be a risk equity investor, and maybe you, Europe is not looking so divergent from US, mm-hmm. and in fact looks inferior from a macro. EM though, we we would say the diff- the opposite, right? I, I think so, and I, I would even you know give give you another point there. I think EM is different and has been different as well in, in its ability to be divergent from one another. There's, you, you touched on it, and, and it was a great point. There's been this, I, I think, uh, illusion and luster around the EU since its formation that it was, to some degree, a cohesive unit. It's not. It's, mm-hmm. I mean, and we're seeing the, the BRICS fall, Brexit, you know, North, North uh, Macedonia, Albania being barred from joining temporarily. But there's never been that illusion around EM but for the kind of the BRICS and, and those classifications. We've been talking about it for a long time, and I think it's been true for, for even longer that we've talked about it. EM markets are so, so dispersed in terms of the specific demographics and specifically the investment opportunities in all those different countries. So I think that will continue. And, and like we said before, you know, finding managers that can dig in and, and look at those opportunities is going to be a stronger, stronger way to invest. Yeah, than there ever. isn't like this overarching policy that is preventing any sort of 
growth or free market or trade or anything like that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And That's all right. those demographics are the exact opposite of Europe, yes. which is they're yeah. very favorable. The yeah. Younger populations, growing the populations. Upside down. Yeah. You know, the yeah. whole thing. Well, so uh, you can't really talk about global macro and decoupling and everyone these kind of topics without bringing in China. I think that was the huge uh, economic fallacy that got that got refuted a decade ago was this idea that the rest of the world had decoupled from China or that China had decoupled the rest of the world. Um, and you know, S and P's went down fifty in the financial crisis, and China went down seventy. So that's where you got this great. Uh, kind of illustration of what the theme we've talked about of levered c- cyclicality that they're 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 uh, levered to that kind of global cyclical condition and 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 if you, all you do is export to other environments China Stephen Roach our old uh, economist at Morgan Stanley has talked about this over and over again China's desperate and generational need and even desire to transition from a, a, a producer economy to consumer economy from export to to domestic production uh, I don't I don't know that they've barely moved the needle there uh, mm. certainly the data would show that it's a bit different it was 10 years ago and 15 years ago but not much I mean it was like this and now it's like this I mean they, they have a lot a lot to go so I guess the question is um, does anyone buy the story that China is potentially bottoming and showing signs of improvement? We know the trade war, that having tariffs not escalate further has got to be better, but is it going to improve China's economic standing or just not worsen China's economic standing? I'll start with you, Brian. We'll I mean, I would, say it's, I would say a little bit of both. Um, you know, I, I would probably err towards the latter of what you just said, which is that it's going to continue, you know, it's, just, it's, it's not, it's, it's more of a, it's not a headwind anymore, and maybe it's not really a tailwind either, but at least it's not a headwind. Hmm. I mean, GDP was still 6%. Inflation's low there. There's still positive fundamentals. There's still growth, those types of things. And um, so generally, the trade war kind of phase one deal is a positive thing for them. And, um, and you're seeing that, I think, in some of the leading indicators is the, there as well. So is copper pricing, you know, we, we have, uh, I'm looking at a chart right now, uh, I, that's attempting to show copper as sort of a leading indicator um, a very similar chart to their producer goods and their industrial production, but with copper leading both by a little bit, that copper prices offer some predictive value. You've seen a little pickup over the last few months in copper. So Are these commodity so, price well, indicators useful? Yeah, why, why is that? Why, why do you think? Okay, maybe. Oh, well, I mean, why is it? As far as copper why being isn't? A, 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 a leading indicator. <laughs> I, the reason is it's 20 years of a chart. I'm just looking at showing it. Okay. okay. But, no, no, but, as far as copper being a, a leading indicator. Because well, there's yeah. virtually no utility for copper anymore that isn't industrial, and, okay. and China is too large a percentage of industrial production for copper to not be necessarily correlated to that kind of activity. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I, I, I think commodity price indicators are, are generally useful, but not uh, foolproof. No, I mean, I don't think I would create an investment strategy around which direction commodity prices are going necessarily, but they're, they can definitely be telling. And I think copper is obviously one it's, that is highly correlated to, to global growth. It's, it's hard when talking about China because I, I personally don't trust a lot of the data that comes out of China still. And, and without seeing you know inventory data, other things that are perhaps influencing copper prices as a result of demand being driven by China, it's hard for me to comment on that one specifically. I, I think a larger, larger picture with China, though, it, when you have a, a, you know, a command and control government, right, mm-hmm. you, you're fully dependent upon policy tools, right? So monetary policy, fiscal policy, they, I, I think a lot of people agree those are extremely influential here abroad elsewhere. But when you expend all those tools or you get down to, you know, the, the lowest ever one-year deposit rates, um, you have a lot of debt floating in the system that's not necessarily what some people could say is good debt. You you have a, a limited capacity for market dynamism to come in and take up the slack. You know, we've seen in the United States if we have, you know, for instance, bad state or federal tax policy or we have tariffs or things like that, there is this competitive drive and spirit that can kind of come pick up the slack, and I worry about China not having that sometimes. So I'm, I'm skeptical a little bit. So that's that's a, a very good point and a very important one when we kind of formulate and think about the the top down concerns or risks that might be in China. But mm-hmm. you know the most popular one that has circulated the last few years is a bit different, which is this overall concern that their financial economy, that their credit growth has just gotten out of control and is this sort of cartoonish bubble. And uh, some real famous short sellers, Kyle Bass, Jim Chanos, mm-hmm. Drunken Miller, have all been in front of this. 
and really, no, no, no pun intended, got their shorts handed to them yeah. by being short. Way, if they are right, they were so early. I don't know if they can ever make money on the trade because they've been so wrong for years now. And yet the data is on their side. The the credit growth, it looks to be being propped up by government. It, but you know, Julian, we've talked a lot about Fed policy here in the U.S. I'm looking at their one year deposit rate right now. It's one and a half percent. Their one year lending rate, four point three percent. Both are the lowest ever. Yes, I was going to say. Uh, um, it sounds like the trades these guys are doing in China are similar to a trade. You know, going against betting against the Fed. You know, uh, you, it's kind of asymmetric. Uh, you know, it's a bet if you bet against somebody who has like the, All the printing, power, the yeah, printing yeah. machine, uh, you're bound to lose. Yeah, you know? Absolutely, it's kind of like don't invest. You know, what what should be invest what is type of thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard to really you know fight the Fed there or here. Especially since rates are a bit higher too, so they have a little bit more room than uh, many of the developed countries. Well, they have another so, policy tool. Yeah. See, these guys equate to 08. And, and of course, the vindication that took place for the famous short sellers in 06, 07, around 08, it provides everyone this permanent talking point about how credit insanity can't go on forever. That's fair enough. I'm with them up to this point. But then, I'm sorry. Mm. China could nationalize the stuff tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could inject it. They have no House of Representatives to ac account to, no <laughs> Occupy Wall Street. No, I mean, it's like they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And the idea that they would let, I, I don't doubt that it's probably trillions of dollars over levered, equivalent to U.S. But I don't know how you could use that to formulate a trade. But my question is not what the hedgies do, are doing or not doing. Let's all stipulate they're going to be fine. Those guys are okay. I'm wondering global macro. If, if look, you, the Fed they can they can kind of paper things over, but as far as the fundamental health and what it means to China's contribution to global economic growth, I certainly think an overlevered corporate economy could become problematic for the rest of the world. I definitely agree. And I think that what they're doing is trying to invest in their economy to convert it from a export led economy to that consumption based economy. And that may take a generation. I, they, you know, they've been doing this for 10, 20 years. And if that doesn't work out and if it doesn't transition at some point, then, yeah, I would assume that there'd be some piper to pay in some way. And, and probably the fundamentals would get worse over time. But that's a pretty long ways out. And from an investment standpoint, that's a hard thing to time and get right in general anyway. So. Um, in the meantime, yeah, it's like Julian said, don't fight the Fed. I wouldn't buy, fight the, uh, the Bank of China either. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think that you're right. And, and yet, I, I, at the same time, I'm sensitive to those that would bring it up, not in a trade environment, but in the sense of macroeconomically what it indicates for these different competing forces. Like, a, like you could argue that they have the ability to kind of artificially prop things up. To Robert's point about their data reliability, I don't think one could say my whole bullish thesis is based on 6% real GDP growth in China and at the same time say, oh, don't fight their Fed there. They can just paper things over. Because what it means is one thing is undermining the validity of the other. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you kind of have to be able to pick which side of it. And I think what you're saying, and I'm agreeing with you, is – it behooves us to not have our global health thesis dependent on the shakier parts of global uh, macro conditions. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, that China right now, uh, there is a black swan potential there. We, we saw it in August 2015 and in January 2016. And, and the really frightening thing, by the way, was that it wasn't that big of a deal what they did. It was just sort of the equivalent of a little pump fake about f currency reserves. Mm -hmm. And they, and they all of a sudden, it was about from peak to trough, about a trillion dollars that came down off their, their currency, reserve, their foreign exchange reserves. But the point is, is that that capital flight, and I wrote about this in, in Dividend Cafe at the time, it was both indicating economic health concerns and creating economic health concerns at the same time. We haven't had that for a while. I think that everyone sort of coordinated policy in February of 16, and the central banks have all been playing, you know, kissy face together for a little while. But I don't know that we can really go to sleep every night thinking that you couldn't get another resurgence of some tension there. Sure. Yeah. And that was a big deal in 15 and 16. That moved markets a big way. 10% in a month in both months. Yeah. yeah. So...
it's definitely out there. Um, okay, well, let me go to you, Dea, on other places. Mm. Uh, we've picked on our friends in Germany and China, um, but let's move around the world. I did hear this morning, actually, that uh, Macron th- thinks he and Trump are okay on uh, champagne tax, that they're going <laughs> to work out this digital tax and maybe not have some European trade threats this, yeah. this year. Um, I have not fully got my arms around the idea of a tariff on champagne becoming systemically threatening to the U.S. economy, but maybe I'm too far removed from the bubbly to under to appreciate that economic risk. But uh, when you get, look outside of France, Germany, and you look outside of China, what else, what else Dea, would you think is pertinent to, to global macro right now? Uh, to global macro, well, we can we can look at uh, we can look at Japan. I mean, mm-hmm. some of the some of the indicators out of Japan, and we tend to focus more on supply side type indicators uh, as far as uh, as far as leading indicators go, business confidence, uh, you, you know, a foreign direct investment. You know, especially when it comes to uh, some of the uh, emerging economies, is very very important. But as far as here here, I mean, it looks like some of the business confidence has recovered uh, after falling for several quarters. Looks like CapEx, capital uh, expenditures, is trending a bit sideways. I mean, it's not going down. Uh, you know, obviously, if it was going down, that'd be a bit of a negative. Uh, so it looks like on the business side of things, things are okay. I mean, current account deficit, uh, that's something that I think is a terrible uh, indicator for a... Uh, or a non-indicator? Or a non-indicator. Uh, so, uh, you know, so... All right, well, um, well, what is an indicator? I mean, we know the story of Japan since... I don't even want to ask how old you were in 1989. I think it'll depress me. <laughs> um, okay, but I mean, think about that day. It's kind of like your whole life that it Japan's is. been I in know. this deflationary yeah. spiral. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, how ironic is what I'm about to say. Their price inflation with the GDP price deflator third quarter was up 0.5% year over year. Okay, that would be very underwhelming inflation in the United States and certainly most parts of the world. That's like the best, if you yeah. want inflation or if you want to fight disinflation, that's the best number Japan's had in 30 years. It's amazing. Are they out? Look, that's not inflation, right? They're, they're, they're at about a 0.5% CPI growth. Uh, their, their wages were at, are still shrinking, uh, basically flattish um, wage growth. But those indicators have all been in disinflationary conditions for a long time. Is some of this Bank of Japan bazooka stuff actually reversing the deflationary spiral, Brian? Um, gosh, I mean, in the in in the short term, yeah. I mean, I it's hard to champion a 05 percent inflation number and think that the thirty year long disinfl you know deflationary environment is is completely over. But it's like, yeah, I mean, rates there are slightly negative. Ten-year Treasuries, JGB is what negative point oh one percent. So as far as inflation goes, the market is telling you that there is none for ten years, basically, um, with those rates. So yeah, the bazooka helps. Uh, without the bazooka, would it be negative? Probably. You know, but they, they're also dealing with a lot of demographic issues too. They're, you know, it's a shrinking population. It's it's hard to really grow out of that. Julian, do you think that the aggressive central banking in Japan helps? Well, it helps uh, limit the damage, but um, uh, as you said, uh, the really the you know what they should add to their mandate is population. I mean, they should really open the borders, and sure. add, you know, you need more people to uh, if you want growth. And uh, I don't know how much should th- the central bank start uh, procreating? Is that maybe <laughs> that's, that, that's really what <laughs> Japan is, you know? <laughs> they, but that's more like a government policy. But they need an, an incentive, and <laughs> open the borders or create yeah. some incentives so that people have at least two point one. You need yeah. two point one child per woman to uh, just renew the population and uh, they probably have the one one and a half or something oh no they're below one yeah they're low. below one yeah. okay so they're, low. they're below right one right. we're Fair we're bare, we're not even at 2.1 <laughs> now in the united states yeah, we're, yeah. we're a tiny tiny bit below that and that japan's been below one for quite some time but you have a lot of immigration that helps as well in the, the u.s, in the yeah. US yeah. which they don't have in japan yeah. Uh, yeah. i don't know how much deficit do they run the government per, per year uh, uh, do, as do far as the budget as deficit, budget deficit, uh, deficit uh, well, they're, hundreds they're, of trillions of yen. Yeah, I mean, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, no, they're, in Japan, they're not running uh, a budget deficit actively. It's the debt to GDP. I, I, as far as their addition to it or the level, La- they're at two hundred sixty percent. Yeah, that which is I was yeah. saying, as a percentage every year of the right, right, GDP. that's right. Yeah, because I, I think that's one of the structural 
issues with Europe is like in the US, I mean, the economy is doing great, but that's at the price of 5% uh, uh, you know, uh, debt, uh, you know, um, deficit every year in Europe with the Eurozone in particular with the Maastricht Treaty, you're not allowed to have more than 3%. And all these countries like Italy and Spain were struggling. They still cannot, you know, try to stimulate the economy with a lot of uh, government uh, induced yeah. uh, policies because of the rules of the Eurozone. Mm. And that's our structural issues that, you know, and, until they change that, Europe will never be able to grow very much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and Rob, I was wondering if that was the same in Japan, good, good basically. Point. But yeah, but see, yeah. I, I kind of wonder, um, we don't have a significant exposure to Japan. We have a couple of companies, it's pretty small weightings in our dividend portfolio that are Japan based, uh, but those are really bottom up stories uh, that have a dividend growth thesis behind them. But when you look across the totality of our asset allocation, I don't have a strong opinion. I certainly believe that their deflationary spiral is far closer to over than beginning after 31 years. Uh, and I'm willing to say that they may have flattened it and be in a period of non-inflation and non-disinflation for some time. But this idea about the central bank helping, it, I, I get what you're saying, and I think a lot more people would agree with that than would, would agree with me. But Robert, I guess I'd ask you, has it helped growth to have their central bank tell every economic actor you're relying on on us to to totally play gimmicks within the economy. Could could they? Uh, I don't want I don't want us right now to relitigate thirty years of policy, <laughs> for which certainly has contained periods of good decisions and bad mm -hmm. decisions. But on a go forward, the reason it's so important for us on this podcast is Japan's the best example and and case in point we're going to get for what U.S. faces around potentially troubled growth. And, and excessive debt levels. And you can't look to Argentina and Zimbabwe as a precedent, but Japan is a reasonably developed and educated and technologically sophisticated economy. I wonder if it's true that their central bank has helped and not actually hurt. Well, look, Japan's the central bank is doing what they know. If I'm not mistaken, they they kind of pioneered the whole uh, QE approach well well in advance of the United States calling totally. it a fiscal experiment. Totally, so, and just so our our listeners are aware, the criticism <laughs> they've taken from American MIT and Harvard economists is that they didn't do more of it and didn't do it sooner. Mm -hmm. But but as far as the notion of buying debt securities yeah. with money that doesn't exist that was done in BOJ long before our Fed did it. Did, we yeah. just didn't call it QE. Yeah. So, We're way better at uh, acronyms. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised that they've been they've been doing this for a long time. I, with with Japan largely, it, you know, that hasn't necessarily worked in terms of stimulating growth, right? I think that's putting it diplomatically. I I. I still am in favor of what's called the abenomics, the the multiple you know quivers and arrows in the quiver approach to, you know, revitalizing the real economy. Julian touched upon it. They have uh, you know demographic issues. We all talked about that. They have you know restrictive immigration policies. They have an aging workplace, and I think corporate culture could could be you know spiffed up a little bit. We saw you know a new spotlight on that with the whole you know Carlos Ghosn situation and all all, all that debacle. So I think debacle. Yeah. This is one of the greatest <laughs> things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, so he came out ahead. It looks like so far so good. <laughs> um, but you know, I don't. I, I I just I just worry when you're fully dependent on the central bank. And I know it's going to sound strange because the United States, some would say we are as well. But you know, you have you have to look at the more structural things that have been holding back an economy like that. Again, the demographics, the growth. You know, I I'm I'm also troubled when I said corporate culture. You look at a, a big CEO of a huge. Uh, tech conglomerate over there that's, you know, investing in all kinds of things around the world. You know, if you if you if you are a corporate leader and you look abroad and say, hey, that's where the growth is. What kind of signals does that give people in your country about their prospects to to grow in the workplace? You know, I think wage inflation is important over there. We talked about how, what's going to stimulate people to have more children. Um, what's going to stimulate immigration? It's it's a lot of these consumer confidence figures. Uh, the wage inflation, and you know, they need they need to do a little bit more there. The VAT certainly didn't help from the confidence perspective. Yeah, I think that's the VAT tax. I'm glad you brought that up. That's I think that's one of the reasons why Japan is being looked at in, in this report and kind of generally as it's getting less bad, it's kind of getting a little better because the VAT tax did hurt the economy, but it kind of that's in the past yeah. and it's sort of muddling through still. So that's considered kind of a good thing going forward. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think that um, 
it, it's difficult to academically to do analysis relative to Japan, U.S. economic conditions relative to Japan, because you're trying to hone in on the things that we share in common, and yet there's these things we don't share in common that that do potentially skew the data and make the parallels or analogies a little more questionable. And, and so the, the, the banking system, the way in which they allowed their banks to survive post-1989, you know, people forget that asset bubble made our 08 look like an a anthill. I mean, just utterly insane. And keep in mind, our Dow was at 10,000 and, and went to 13,000 and came back down and, and uh, boiled below 10 and then took a couple years to get back and make a new high. And then now is obviously uh, just dramatically moved higher. The Nikkei right now in 2020 is barely half of what it was in 1989. That's crazy. That's how much of a bubble they were in in their uh, stock, real estate, and credit markets. And, and the reason I bring this up as far as the difference in Japan was they allowed these zombie banks to stick around for so long that I don't know, it, you know, where things we hold in common with them, where we don't. The things I do know that I can look to is debt to GDP. The demographics are obviously different, and you and you brought that up. Uh, the ability to organically create output is just not something the U.S. has ever really had to question. And so, right now, the part that I'm focused on, and I think most economists are focused on, is the uh, drag that excessive debt sovereign debt brings to a country. And Japan produces this great analogy, but there are other things that are not analogous that makes it more nuanced. It makes it difficult to say pure Japanification in the U.S. and no Japanification in the U.S. I think the truth is going to play out to be somewhere in between, mm -hmm. and it's just something we have to continue to monitor and study. Um, well, all, all good input around the Japan front. So let's just kind of bring it to a, some conclusions. Uh, not so much specific to Germany and China and, and EM and Japan, but just here in the U.S. in light of all global conditions, I think that um, we, we already have talked to listeners a lot and our belief capital expenditures are the big trillion dollar question, business investment, business confidence. Um, do we believe that 2020, the global economic conditions are going to be a net positive to U.S.? or a net negative? I'll start with you, Brian. Um, I think there'll be a net positive, but in a very small way. So global conditions are turning up a little, and that's kind of what we've been talking about here today. But there's by no means this giant re resurgence and, and a powerhouse of global growth. It's just not getting worse anymore. It's not slowing anymore. It's getting a little bit better. So I think that'll be a little bit of more of a, of a tailwind than a headwind going into 2020. And I think fundamentals here in the U.S. are, are generally pretty good. Dan, yeah. U.S. economic activity in 2020 benefits from global, suffers from global, doesn't care about global. I, I think I, I, I agree with what Brian said. I think it benefits a little. And really, the uh, the cause of that benefit is just the de-escalation of the U.S.-China uh, trade disputes. And I, I think that's a leading story here. And I think, obviously, as far as the thematic, uh, you know, talk goes, I think that's going to remain a central theme is how these, super, you know, uh, you know, one budding superpower and the other incumbent superpower deal with each other for the uh, coming years. So oh, Good points. Yeah. Uh, Robert, other factors besides the trade deal, um, does Brexit matter here? Does um, potentially stabilizing political environment in some countries where populism was running amok, uh, what, what positives would you extract globally other than the obvious about trade? I mean, I think there, you could dig in more on the populism issue. You look at you know, consolidation of power in a couple of countries, notably Turkey, Russia, so that, you know, kind of narrows the distribution, but perhaps adds a little tail risk in some of those places. Um, you look at structural reforms, you know, Argentina just changed administration, so we'll see what happens there. They're kind of known for, you know, borrow, default, rinse, and repeat cycles. We'll see how that plays out here with mm -hmm. the, the prior administration coming back in. Um, but again, I think, you know, to your point, I would agree with you completely. I think mm -hmm. that they are going to add emerging markets to global markets will add a little bit to the United States. And I think we're going to know sooner rather than later. I think a lot of the, the headlines are going to shift to what's happening reform-wise, structurally, populism, et cetera, in those countries. 
Um, but I think the United States is still, I wouldn't say the, the, the Tina trade, but I think we're still the best alternative mm-hmm. in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Julian, where would you uh, maybe add to what your colleagues have sh- shared here? Um, I guess it's going to be probably a, a second half of the year question for where, where we're going to land in 2020. So we're expecting like some, you know, mo- you know, modest recovery in the first half and then better in the, the second. So it's it's back and dated so that's that's the big question mark um for me uh us uh, china trade relationship still like number one you know not talking about the fed but after the fed in terms of uh, what uh, i'm worried about or focused on mm-hmm. and it could go really both ways you could have some you know uh, bad blood and and it goes back uh, to like uh, you know escalation and that could really even if it doesn't impact the economy immediately, it impacts business confidence and you know every and then capex investment goes on hold like we've seen last year. Or it could be the other way around actually because there's still 360 billion of tariffs at the moment that are there and that Trump can. Uni- uh, in fairness, you mean tariffs on 360 billion of of trade? Uh, yeah, of trade. Okay. So I'm, I'm saying is like we know it's like if you need a boost before the election, you know you can uh, the president could decide any time to you know make. It. Uh, uh, to uh, have some uh, good gesture and and uh, just take some o- or all of them away, and that would really be a big boost. And nobody, I think, is pricing that at the moment uh, because I think phase two is expected after the election. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I you just brought something up that I think, fr- fr- from a, a probability standpoint, it warrants comment. We would argue that there has not been enough discussion of the probability. I think last podcast we said 10 to 20 percent probability of trade war escalation, particularly maybe with Europe or something. Low probability, but being kind of ignored. But there would be a higher than that probability of the president offering some sort of relief in an election year. I think so. I mean, I guess we've seen like point. how the whole mm-hmm. rhetoric changed last year when probably he met with some advisor, realized, oh, we're one year to the election and now we have to really... You know, it's hurting the economy. You want to be reelected. It's, you know, just look at the S&P 500, look at the, where the economy is. And he knows that. And that was a really big reversal. And so I would expect, you know, it's more likely to have surprised that in going the same direction than the, uh, the other way around. So I would, you know, I think that's more likely. Yeah. Although the only political uh, sort of anecdotal comment I'll make is you could, there's a potential of that not helping them. If he wants to run on America first, Rust Belt, industrial America, the stuff that got him elected, it could be viewed as a sign of weakness if he capitulates on the early tariffs as yeah, well. That's true. So that that could I could see both sides to that. It's probably like an ace in the in the hole that yeah. he'll play over the year is my bet really you know some tariff relief here and there and, and maybe not do it all at once and then i guess otherwise there's like what's not priced in so you know we've already had one kind of event that was unexpected uh, you know war the escalation with iran and that you know uh that went uh, away in a week now there's another one we haven't talked about but this uh virus you know like mm. the last time in 2003 mm. that was I think that put the impact on the economy in 2003. Bird, I don't think so. Bird flu? Is it, yeah, I mean, I guess it's more like people are freaking out I thought about it, I thought about it, and I didn't include it because I'll tell you why. I, you were very critical of financial media on, on our podcast, but primarily in our relationship with clients. We serve as an antidote to misinformation and exaggeration and things like that. And I'm not suggesting that thing couldn't become a big story, but I woke up this morning and saw this, this thing, read a little... I got back from the gym and then I saw flu virus issue in China disrupting markets. And then I saw Dow down 32 points. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to play into this nonsense. If it becomes a story, it becomes a story. Mm-hmm. But they but they can't have their cake and eat it too. You can't present a lower than average volatility day That's right. and say, oh, well, this volatility is coming from the – it's like, yeah. give me a break. Of course, yeah. it's early days. But I guess like now I'm just curious to – I want to go back to see what, you know, what happened in 2003 because I – you know, I, I would bet that, again, this is not really big for the economy, but that's enough. If people get scared and stop flying, you know, that could help the economy. Just because. It'll help, it'll help me. I don't <laughs> need all the lines. 2003 was actually like a 2000 and like 2017, if I remember. I mean, there was like no volatility in the entire year. Yeah, the, the market was the up the market, entire year. It was like 10 points a day for the entire year. So yeah. I'm not. I'm assuming that the Asian bird flu. Yeah. The, the, I would think it's a non-event. But 800 way. people died. Yeah. Um, I don't know what impact he had on the economy, but I'll just I'll just yeah, have yeah. a research it. No, just, a good point. Our, our it's a friend point. of the Bonson Group, Nick Murray, and and, and myself, we will keep our list going of things that 
uh, become this big story for about four days, and you never hear about it so, again. Yeah, I, so I wonder what the on a day like today, what the media kind of does, or like if there's any sort of volatility at all, they try to find some sort of causal link for that volatility. <laughs> but there's no volatility. Yeah, yeah. It's not even about whatever, volatility. Whatever it is. Yeah. They, there doesn't even have to be volatility because the headline doesn't story. require the headline doesn't require real vol. Right. They just need a headline. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm on a tangent, but mm-hmm. I think that um, there, there, there's a whole long, long list of things that obviously they could be newsworthy, and and maybe become market stories. But the point is, is it's something like 99 to one of the ones that end up become a legitimate versus not uh, of ones that are illegitimate versus ones that are not. Yeah. I think I think that um, that right now all the stuff we talked about today. It sounds like we're in a consensus view. The U.S. is still the best house in the neighborhood. The neighborhood overall might be getting a little better, but we don't want to get carried away as far as global economic neighborhood. Um, leading indicators showing some signs of life and potentially this possibility, maybe not priced in, that Europe and China have seen some of their worst days and we could get a little improvement. So I don't think any of us are disagreeing with any of the, the big picture. Does anyone have anything else they want to add that they've been dying to say? And then I'm going to take us out with a couple of closing comments. Anyone got anything else? I, I would just say um, there's also, you know, the, the chance that uh, the Fed would give you a gift this year if, if the data is not as good as expected. I mean, they clearly said they're not going to do it yeah. sounds like the first half of the year. But, you know, market is kind of pricing for, uh, more than 50% chance of a cut by the end of the year. So... It looks like the Fed could have our back if it doesn't, you know, in the economy doesn't recover as much as we hope. That's a good point. So I uh, am looking at a chart right now that shows the Fed funds rate um, oh, since financial crisis. And, it, of course, they had been raising a little bit, and then they cut it last year. But then I'm also looking at the actual money stock mm-hmm. and how much the money stock, M2, dropped when they began quantitative tightening and began unwinding some of the QE and then how much it has skyrocketed up in more recent times. And if you want to find a really, really strong correlation to how markets have done, and this is global as much Mm -hmm. as U.S., it won't be connected to GDP, and it won't even be connected to Fed funds. It will be connected to liquidity. Velocity of money. And and the ability Mm -hmm. to have velocity of money, which, again, is not one cause and the other. It's both them feeding off each other. You get a velocity of money in a better economy, and you get a better economy when there's more velocity of money because there's more liquidity and credit driving economic activity. Uh, it's not good for us to be so dependent on priming and artificially boosting liquidity. And even for those like you, I know what you meant, but when you, when you talk about the Fed giving a gift, there's some gifts I'd be careful of unwrapping, you know, because you, you, you get a big gift of candy and you unwrap it and you eat it and it's wonderful, but then you're going to have a stomachache later. Oh, well, you have to pay for it one day. you got to yeah, pay for sure. it. Yep. And we learned it in late. I just made that analogy no, up yeah, right now. That's good. Um, I think that the late 2018 market gyration proves it. There's some Fed things that have been done. They felt like gifts at the time, and then they weren't a gift when they had started taking it back a bit. And they're going to take it back at some point. So uh, that's, to me, the story right now in global macro is the entire world, Japan with their bank, Europe with their bank, China with their bank, the U.S. with our Fed, how reliant we all are in Federal Reserve activity and how incapable the very uh, a lot of countries have been. Luckily, the U.S. has done better than most, but nowhere near our full potential in terms of output gap to create organic and healthy economic growth that's decoupled from monetary interventions. I think that's the big global macro story. And unfortunately, it's still going to be a monetary economy for as long as we can see. Now, the positive side, I really was feeling about four or five months ago that the services sector looked like it was starting to decline and the ISM non-manufacturing had some bad prints. Those things, those seem to have really rebounded. I, I, I feel that it's, we're pretty exclusive right now in the manufacturing area of our economy where we're seeing weakness and that lack of business expenditure. However, getting that to kind of re, I don't know if it reverts to 2016, 17, excuse me, 17 or early 18 levels or not, but U.S. macro, it's business expenditures, global macro, it's just going to be a 30-year story of dealing with the prior 30-year story. 
uh, spending run amok and how everyone has to go around balancing that and putting their fingers in the holes on the dam to deal with it. And in the meantime, you got to be focused on fundamentals and individual companies and their profit-seeking activities. It's the only thing you can invest in unless someone has figured out a mousetrap for how they're going to invest in and around the machinations of central bankers. I, I, uh, I don't see that as being very feasible. I'd rather bet on the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Niners or uh, Chiefs? You know, we've had some action last couple of years, haven't we? <laughs> we have. I think I think I got <laughs> I think you last be, year, and you, you got me the year before. Yeah, I think we might be even at this point. Uh, of course, we don't bet real money because that's not allowed. <laughs> of course, no. But I mean, we have this gentleman's bet. It's a handshake. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? It's really difficult. I I don't like San Francisco, uh, and the Mahomes guy is so fun to watch. Yeah. But it's really difficult to bet against San Francisco what uh, they did to Green Bay in that first solid, half. Solid, yeah, they're that was just, destruction. They're just really good. But um, you know, they're both new quarterbacks in the Super Bowl. We saw at the Rams last year mm. that a first-time quarterback in the Super Bowl usually struggles a little. They don't necessarily get to come in and just play like their normal my, regular season selves. My prediction is that this Super Bowl will at least be better than last year's Super Bowl. Won't take much. <laughs> Won't take much. That was the worst. Well, for all of you listening, thanks for. Uh, uh, checking in on this special edition of the Dividend Cafe Investment Committee podcast. Uh, we took you on a little trip around the world. Maybe next week we'll do a special global macro discussion of Mars, Venus, and Neptune because <laughs> we are out of places on Earth to check in on. Uh, don't forget to listen to this Friday's Dividend Cafe where I'll be coming back with all the things near and dear to my heart uh, throughout this week in the markets and more. Uh, a lot of politics, things happening, so forth and so on. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments on this week, reach out to us anytime. Happy to elaborate further on some of the subjects we delved into here today. We would really appreciate your positive reviews, shares, and forwards and things like that, supporting this uh, Dividend Cafe podcast. And with that, we bid you do and thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe. <music>